Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm very, very excited today to uh, be talking to you about BACnet Secure Connect, a brand new thing that a lot of people in the community have been talking about. And we have two amazing panelists here to talk to us about what it actually is. So um, I was, it is my pleasure to introduce Bernard Eisler from uh, Siemens, joining us uh, all the way from Europe, Switzerland, I believe, Bernhard? Yes, it's Switzerland. Perfect. So thanks so much for joining us today. And Bernhard is the uh, main writer behind the white paper and a huge driving force uh, in backend SC. Right, and that's true. <laughs> good, good. Um, and David Fisher as well, a big presence on the BACnet SC committee and has been working towards a lot of BACnet in general. Um, and David joins us from PolarSoft. So welcome, David. Thanks for coming today. Great. All right. Um, so we did want to quickly say at the beginning of this that these are all of our opinions. They don't necessarily represent the views of the companies that we work for or ASHRAE. Um, these are simply our thoughts. Many of them may align with those organizations, but that's simply coincidental. Um, also, this standard is not fully published yet, so we wanted today to give you all a bit of an idea of what's going on and the process that's going to, uh, that it's going to go through over the next few months, um, but it may, may completely change. So don't, uh, don't, just take it all with a grain of salt, I guess I'll say. And lastly, uh, there is a, a white paper that has been put together um, by Bernhard and David and uh, Michael Osborne on what the backend SC actually is. We sent it to all of you. Everyone should have received it beforehand, but it's also available as a download handout on uh, GoToWebinar. So feel free to download that, take a look at it. All right, without further ado, let's get into this. Um, we're just going to start with what is BACnet SC? Why, well, well, let's start with sort of how do we end up here? Why is BACnet SC being uh, being developed? Why do we need it? Okay. Bernard, do you want to start with this? Yes, sure. Uh, so originally we started out uh, because we found that, uh, and most of you know that BACnet IP has uh, some uh, features uh, that are not well accepted by uh, IT departments in particular. Uh, the use of uh, UDP, of the UDP protocol, makes them heartburn. So uh, uh, we found uh, the IT working group uh, in particular to make uh, BACnet IT friendly. So over time we uh, end secure uh, at the same time. So um, uh, originally we started off with a, with a new approach for the protocol stack but then moved back and uh, made it just a new data link option in BACnet. So uh, that's essentially how we got there. And uh, the goal was always to provide some uh, uh, IT friendliness and uh, include security that is uh, well known by IT departments. So uh, uh, currently we uh, define to use a TLS version 1.3 and essentially Secure Connect sits on a, a secure web sockets which allow to pass through uh, whatever IT environment uh, including support of uh, DHCP and DNS and uh, NAT and firewalls etc. So <clears throat> the, uh, the current approach uh, provides uh, quite a number of uh, features that make BACnet uh, uh, a good citizen in IT department managed networks. David, maybe you might add something? Uh, sure. I, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, uh, point out that the, one of the primary ideas in BACnet SC is to have all uh, BACnet SC communications be very secure. Uh, and, and when we say very secure, we mean um, uh, with strong encryption uh, that, that cannot be uh, broken for all practical purposes. Uh, uh, in, in a reasonable amounts of time. The, as Bernard said, we are using literally the same accepted best practices that are used in IT groups, uh, banks, military installations, and so forth. Um, this is very, very strong 
uh, and secure uh, communication. That means that, that for the first time, we'll be able to use a uh, backnet over the public internet without other special uh, means. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, but one of the things that is essential that you take away from this talk is to recognize that this is 100% backward compatible with existing backnet systems. Uh, in order to have BACnet SC, you don't have to throw anything away, uh, and you won't be losing uh, any BACnet capability uh, in an existing system. And we will get into that in detail. Yes. So don't worry. Great. So, yeah, as you said, this is all an endeavor to be more cyber secure, to match with IT and all of these different Everything in our world needs to be more cyber secure. So what is it? How are we doing that? The big question. Well, let, <clears throat> let's take a look at um, what uh, a traditional BACnet network looks like. Bernard, do you want to speak to this? You're right. Um, today, uh, essentially, the, um, uh, the the measures that are usually taken to secure a backnet network is uh, to install some VPN technologies uh, like uh, virtual LANs or uh, even a uh, real VPN uh, environments, so that uh, uh, hackers cannot really see the uh, backnet traffic and cannot really join the backnet traffic. But that's all done by some extra uh, equipment usually and needs of course a setup which is uh, sometimes not very simple to do so uh, that's that's the current uh, uh, approach to secure the networks however uh, not all installations do that and sometimes uh, uh, people just uh, uh, silently ignore their uh, security requirements and let the whole thing run totally openly, which is a, a danger, of course, for the facility. Right, and that's, I would point out, Bernard, that that's even if you don't have a public internet connection. Uh, there are some facilities that, that actually, I should say most facilities that use BACnet don't attempt to secure the infrastructure within the facility. Uh, they assume that anyone who has physical access to the uh, facility is also allowed to use BACnet. Right, right. So, uh, so um, you know, even though uh, when this is all internal on, on, on the regular IP network, it's still open and uh, depending on the installation, there might so be some script script kiddies in a university campus or so on. and. Uh, these guys should not have access to uh, the backnet system, simply. And uh, that's why people are typically using VPNs or separate lines, physically separate or virtually separated. So that's the technologies that people are using currently. Hopefully, we hope everyone is securing their networks with other means. Right. That's, okay. especially, that's especially true, Monica, in, in this scenario where you want to have access to the facility across the public internet because in that context uh, the anyone who is a hacker who wants to try to um, get to that network could be anywhere they don't even really need physical access anymore so uh, as long as as there is some sort of vpn uh, or appliance or other setup that secures the public side uh, I guess that's okay, but as Bernard said, that's very um, that can be very uh, complex and costly in order to uh, in order to do that. You and, far too that? Often, and far too often, it's just not done. Right. Yeah. You want to add to that, Bernard? No, actually, that's uh, that's essentially true. And of course, as soon as you want to do internet access to the patent system, then uh, you cannot use virtual lines anymore. So you need to have full-blown uh, VPN technologies, which is uh, sometimes not easy to handle and uh, yeah, requires maintenance and management. Right. Okay. So, um, what what is this backnet SC? Is this where we put in the drum roll? Right. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, All right. uh, so uh, the Secure Connect essentially uses a uh, WebSocket connections over TLS, Transport Layer Security, for uh, backnet message transport. So that's uh, essentially the, the, the way how uh, Secure Connect is securing backnet traffic and allows to build uh, backnet systems that are secured by uh, uh, TLS, which is uh, normally used also in the web or when, when you are doing uh, uh, e-banking and other critical applications that's typically and normally secured by TLS. So essentially the, uh, the backnet messages as they are, uh, we don't change their content essentially, get simply transported over a, a secure WebSocket instead of, for example, plain MSTP or plain uh, IP, backnet IP over UDP. So the backnet messages get transported in, in a secure channel and we need a hop function, which is essentially the, uh, uh, the translation between a connection-oriented communication that we are using versus the connectionless uh, communication patterns that the backend applications are using. So the hop is essential for uh, making this uh, possible that we can run backend as it is or a connection-oriented architecture. Maybe David. Yeah, um, Bernard, one of the things I, I think it's important for us to point out is in a, in a regular, or let's say in the, the traditional before BACnet SC BACnet system, uh, someone who has physical access to the network carrying BACnet messages can actually see the content of BACnet messages if they have the expertise and desire to do that. Uh, so one of the things that happens in BACnet SC is that those messages are strongly encrypted. And that's what I mean by these little black blocks here with the, with the scrambled letters in them. We have no idea, even though we can see the letters, we don't have any idea what they mean. Uh, and so that, but that's an important concept that the BACnet messages stay the same, but they are in essence wrapped in a, in an invisible cloak uh, that that can't be removed, uh, at least uh, not practically speaking. So, if, if say you plugged in a device with Wireshark or a device that had an uh, a capture capability like that, it would be gibberish, basically. That's right. I mean, they they can see the gibberish, but you know, yeah. Good luck trying to decode. Right. Yeah. Right. And. And this also includes that uh, you cannot just simply connect you know, the backnet SC device to the network. You need to have a, a properly signed certificate on your device to join that network. Otherwise, you cannot really join that network. So before, essentially, as soon as you had a hardware that can connect to the network uh, you were in, you could participate in the communication. Here, you need a signed certificate which can be compared to a, a key to, to the system. So the, there is protection of, uh, for uh, keeping uh, uh, malicious users out because uh, they, uh, of course, when, when you give them a key, then they are in, but uh, the question here is, uh, whom do you give a key? To what devices do you give a key? And those devices can come in to the network. Now, uh, Bernard, one of the things that a lot of people ask is, you know, the, it's one thing if you're doing a banking connection, which is just between, let's say, you and your bank. Um, but in building automation, it's very common for us to want to be able to send messages that have multiple recipients. Uh, so can you talk about how, um, how BACnet SC manages that? Right, right. That's another, that's no, another important part of the hub. Uh, the hub, uh, as mentioned before, uh, is essentially uh, responsible to distribute broadcast messages. So uh, whenever you would have who is and uh, who has uh, requests that get broadcast, they get distributed to all participants uh, by the hub. And uh, so uh, everyone that joins the network uh, uh, by connecting to the hub, gets the broadcasts uh, uh, received from the hub. Uh, and so the, uh, the the communication patterns that you need on the application level, they still work 
at the exact same way uh, within BACnet Secure Connect. But again, the hub plays a role here. That's important. Plus, we eliminate the um, regular broadcasts from right. uh, normal IT traffic, which makes IT people much happier. Right, right. So there is a no um, IP level broadcast or multicast anymore. Uh, subnet uh, boundaries, IP subnet boundaries do not play a role anymore. Uh, not boxes and firewalls, etc. They can all be passed through without uh, any particular measures. Um, this all works, and uh, so uh, the, this allows to uh, uh, maintain uh, the, the backend communication patterns on the application level, but also allows to spread such a network essentially through whatever IP infrastructure you have, because the IP infrastructure itself the structure that they have is not necessarily important. The only thing that needs to be open is HTTP communication, but that's usually anyway open in such networks. So we have a couple questions here that I think are fairly relevant. Um, so one is who issues those keys? And I know we don't want to get too deep into the keys because I think we could all talk for three hours about the keys, but who is the owner of those and how does that work? Okay, um, I might start with that. So the the uh, uh, the approach could have been that every device knows the certificate of of uh, any other device, but this creates um, a tremendous uh, certificate management problem. So we went to a concept that uh, uh, all certificates that devices have need to be signed by uh, a determined certificate authority, because uh, the that certificate authority, the certificate of that authority is also uh, uh, configured into the devices such that devices accept con and the hub uh, accepts connections only uh, if the device can present the certificate that got signed by that certificate authority he knows. So um, the, uh, uh, the security setup is essentially to uh, provide uh, uh, a device certificate that is signed by the certificate authority and uh, as soon as you get that certificate you can uh, join the network. So the key uh, element within this is essentially the certificate authority which you could consider being a key box and uh, every device needs a key out of that key box and yeah. all participants, even, even though the devices could be tools, whatever, uh, everyone that needs to join the network needs a key from that key box essentially. So in, in technical terms, it needs to have a certificate signed by that certificate authority that uh, the installation is using. Okay. So, um, I don't know, David, do you want to add to that? No, that's good. Okay, great. Yeah, so, I mean, perfect. Uh, I think who issues it is is really a lot of these questions are going to be on a case by case basis, but typically it, it should be the the person who's owning the network, the building owner. Um, but that's going to it's there's going to be a lot of these things that are kind of figured out in each case as well. So um, another question which I think can be cleared up pretty quickly. What's going to happen to BB, BBMDs in this scenario? Oh, I could say some it? words on that. So that there is um, no BBMD anymore. So forget about uh, BBMD configuration and uh, static IP addresses. That's just not uh, used anymore. The hub takes uh, part of the functionality in that it distributes broadcasts, but uh, but uh, we don't have BBMDs anymore uh, in Secure Connect. So the, the heart of the whole thing is the hub uh, that uh, is responsible for distributing uh, broadcasts, but it has some more uh, functionality uh, within Secure Connect. And uh, as I said before, since we are using secure WebSockets and uh, we address the hub through uh, uh, WebSocket URIs, um, we, do, we are not depending on uh, static IP addresses for the hub or uh, uh, whatever. So it can be a regular URI with a DNS name for the host and even uh, some resource path to uh, find the hub 
uh, in the network and make a WebSocket connection to it. Perfect. So we have a lot of questions coming in, which is fantastic. Keep them coming. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the backwards compatibility and some of these other things, and we will get back to these questions. So don't you worry. We're not we're not abandoning all these questions, um, but hopefully we can answer some of them through the next part as well. So let's move on to talking a little bit about the backward compatibility and how that's going to work. Um, actually, just before we get into that, Monica, the, let's talk about the fact that um, some people would look at this picture and they'd say, well, the only problem with this is if something happens to the hub, then then I'm I'm toast. Uh, oh, because yeah. obviously the, top, the hub is playing a central, literally a central role uh, in, in what we're doing. Um, so in BACnet SC, there's a concept where we can actually have uh, uh, a primary and a failover situation. Bernard, do you want to talk about that? Yes, right. Um, so essentially nodes um, depicted here as some gray uh, circles, they essentially connect uh, uh, to the primary hub uh, regularly, but uh, they, have, uh, they have knowledge and can have knowledge, that's an option. Uh, so you can configure also a, a failover hub into the node. So whenever they cannot reach the primary hub anymore, they try to connect to the failover hub. And uh, so you can uh, have uh, two hubs uh, in, for a backnet network. Uh, one is the primary that is usually used and uh, the other one is the failover hub. But uh, uh, the knowledge about which is the primary hub and which is the failover hub is solely in the nodes. So the hub function as such is always the same. And uh, you see that we have some future plans for the hub function as well. So uh, to uh, not make it a, a backend specific hub function, but allowing other hub functions. But the same holds. And uh, so the, the essential part is that you can configure into the nodes uh, that they should use a failover hub if there is no primary hub. And all nodes are required to support the mechanism but in an installation, you can certainly have just a primary hub when you feel that that primary hub has some redundancy mechanisms otherwise, or you simply trust in your network and you don't need it. So the failover hub is an optional uh, uh, deployment, but all nodes, all SC nodes know how to connect to either primary and failover hub. And Bernhard, is this a special hub? This is a question that we received. Is it a special hub or is it a, just a normal hub? Well, actually, we, we chose to uh, define uh, uh, a secure connect hub function, which is very lean, very straightforward, very simple to implement, and uh, doesn't require much uh, uh, infrastructure or uh, complex servers. That's just uh, one thing that we that we do for now. Uh, that's simple to implement, and that's a required feature that nodes can connect to that SC hub function. However, uh, uh, we have uh, designed the thing such that we can also define the use of uh, other hub functions like MQTT brokers or maybe even in the future AMQP environments. AMQP, that's the Advanced Message Queuing Protocol, some uh, internet uh, protocol suite for uh, messaging uh, that could also be used essentially. But uh, that's, uh, uh, that's always, uh, think of that being uh, an additional option that Node can support. But uh, for interoperability, we will stay with uh, requiring uh, support for the SC hub function and all other uh, hub functions that could come uh, in in the future would be optional uh, additional support that you might implement in your nodes. Right. Bernard, just to summarize, I, I think the, um, the short answer to the question is there, there's only one kind of hub and, and any hub can be a, a primary or a failover. Uh, so there's there's nothing special about um, about those that hub function. Any hub function can be primary or failover. Right, right. So the the uh, the that's totally right. That a hub function is not specific specific to be the primary or failover hub function. 
Right. There's no difference. There is a single hop function in, and it's an installation determination which one is playing the primary and which one is playing the, uh, the failover hop. Okay. Great. So Monica, maybe we can swing back, circle back uh, to your original question. How does this backward compatibility work? Perfect. <clears throat> Let's take a look at that. Um, the, you know, in a traditional backnet, we have a, let's call it an envelope or a wrapper around the backnet message. And uh, let's see if I can. So here, this green uh, box is a traditional BACnet IP wrapper. And inside there is the real BACnet message uh, that says whatever you're trying to do, reading and writing points, sending alarms and so forth. Now, a BACnet SC message is just really, at the end of the day, is a different kind of a wrapper. But the, the point is that the, the BACnet part is exactly the same in both of these two types of messages. So what we're really doing is, is wrapping and unwrapping the very same backnet mass message and sending it uh, in a more secure way sort of like uh, you know putting something in an armored car so in a in the traditional let's say backnet ip or mstp uh, we're sending around traditional messages and those are secure or not secure depending on whether you've added extra capabilities like a VPN. But the way that we remain backward compatible is through the use of, of BACnet routers that understand both BACnet SC and IP. You want to add to that, Bernard? Yes, um, uh, that's the, uh, the, the general concept essentially to make this uh, backward compatible. But what's also interesting, what this picture shows uh, uh, compared to uh, back at IP on the Secure Connect side, we don't need any additional VPNs or VLANs, etc., because it's um, inherently secure. Uh, no special uh, devices are needed, uh, no special VPNs, uh, setups, etc. That's that's not needed because uh, uh, the security is built into the backnet communication on the SC side. All right. I think uh, I'm sure we're getting more and more questions on all of this stuff. So um, I think that, that makes a lot of sense to me. So if you have questions, throw them in there. We'll answer them. Um, but I want to move on to the timeline of all of this. So um, actually, actually, before we get that, one thing I wanted to ask about um, backwards compatibility is how much more secure is it to have this backwards compatible system? Because obviously the most secure is going to be having an entirely backnet SC system. Um, the least secure is having an, a current backnet system with no VPN or anything. Um, is, it, is it going to be worth taking off your VPN and switching over your current security to uh, and adding this one hub for the whole IP network to go to the internet? Is that going to be worth it, or is it is it maybe only a thing to think about as you're putting in more devices and building well, out think, your network? I believe that uh, it should be a, a stepwise approach, so there is no need to rip out what you already have, right? So uh, the uh, the trick would be to add a backnet SC to whatever backnet you have and uh, to continue on on the secure connect side. So uh, whenever you have things uh, uh, that you replace, etc., you need to consider whether you move them over to the SC side when those products become available. And then um, over time, you will get everything onto the SC side and uh, uh, your structure could even include multiple backnet SC networks. So um, there are uh, tremendous possibilities and uh, what's uh, um, pretty elegant, actually, is that uh, you are no longer bound to uh, IP network boundaries or structures like subnets, etc. You don't need to care about that anymore, right? On the secure connect side, so you can freely design your uh, backnet networks uh, across the IP uh, infrastructure that you have, 
so there is no need to figure out uh, whether I place something into IP subnet X or Y. That's uh, that's no longer a problem. So uh, uh, I see, uh, and essentially that's always that was always the plan to allow some stepwise uh, migration towards a secure connect, and that's possible through uh, 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 backnet routing, essentially between the old existing stuff and the new stuff. I guess I would add to that, Bernard, looking at it from the other side, uh, and that is, the, to answer Monica's question, well, you use BACnet SC anywhere that you want to have more security, uh, or, or that you feel that there's a threat to the security of the information that, or control that BACnet is, is exerting. So in some facilities, uh, you know, where you have a, a much uh, stronger security concern, well, then uh, migrating to a BACnet SC uh, sooner than later uh, is what you would want to do. But uh, if you don't have those specific security concerns, uh, then as, as Bernard says, well, simply evolve over time uh, to using more and more BACnet SC. Uh, and then, you know, the cost is distributed over uh, a very long time that way. Right, right. right. Yeah, and, and for new installations, I would guess that uh, go straight for Secure Connect if you need that security level. And, uh, yeah, Secure Connect, that's, uh, that's then uh, the uh, solution to take, right? But, but I would be, be hasty to point out that it, it really is driven by how much security you want to have, okay? The I could put a bank vault door on my refrigerator and that would keep people from stealing my food. Um, but uh, at the other hand, that's very expensive and it makes it a pain in the neck to get into my fridge. So do, do I want that level of security for that portion of my house or not? Right, right, right. right. Yeah, and that's a, that's a very general security uh, uh, consideration, right? So what's your risk? What do you try to uh, 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 protect? And uh, that should give the measures that you take because security doesn't really come for free. There is a cost with it and uh, that's unavoidable uh, because uh, that's really a thing. So as long uh, as, long as you have your, your doors always open on your house, you don't need to manage keys because you don't need keys, but as soon as you uh, want to uh, lock it up because you want to protect something, then you start getting keys. And so this is important to understand that now you need to deal with the keys to that system. Um, I mean, and just to, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say that the short answer is if you have teenage children, you need to have BACnet SC on your fridge. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. Um, and just to clarify, one of the questions coming in um, is some, some confusion about what the hub is. And so correct me if I'm wrong, um, Bernhard and David, but the SC hub is going to be a specific device that you will need to buy from a BACnet manufacturer. It will be a new device that currently doesn't exist um, on the market, or, or it will be an addition to current devices that are available on the market. You can't just go and buy a hub at Best Buy. Oh, well, actually, that depends on what uh, vendors try to uh, sell to the market, but essentially it's a software function, right? It can be deployed, it can exist in some, let's say, larger uh, embedded controllers easily, like uh, some, let's say, higher class Raspberry Pi level controllers. But it can also be, of course, uh, something in a cloud, can be a cloud service, very dedicated to uh, uh, serve particular backend networks. It can exist everywhere almost. So it can be even in, in a, let's say, in a dedicated device, but maybe in a, in a backnet router uh, straight. So uh, uh, there is a pretty much freedom of uh, where uh, the hub function can exist. And so it really uh, depends on uh, vendors, uh, what products they will do. But we expect uh, uh, hub functionality to be supported by larger controllers like building controllers, supervisory controllers, but also some cloud services likely uh, so that uh, you can do uh, connections uh, from and into the cloud. 
because we don't of course we don't define hardware we don't define software that's all that's all about the, the protocol on the right yeah i think i think it's highly likely that if today you have a backnet router for example between ip and mstp it's highly likely that those existing products will update their software uh, to include sc functionality not necessarily but you know uh, at, at, Manufacturers who make routers will probably think that way. Uh, yeah, right. And as Bernard points out, there are, are many larger building automation controllers on the market that also do routing in addition to their control features. So that I think all of those are, are possible outcomes, uh, you know, once SC is available. Yeah, right, right. And as uh, soon as you already have backnet over IP, you have the necessary hardware in place to connect to the IP network. So um, supporting uh, Secure Connect is a software issue and we will see how vendors deal with that. But we know of uh, a high interest by vendors to implement it, to support it. And uh, so we will see products pretty soon, I guess. I think that's so, actually a nice segue, Monica, into the topic. Exactly. It's a perfect segue. And it's one thing that I want to make very clear to everyone that BACnet and BACnet SC are protocols and how we as a community, whether, um, you know, there's people on our webinar that are representing manufacturers and systems integrators and um, people that are actually on their campus. So it really is up to all of those people of how it gets implemented. Um, SC is just the protocol saying this is how it works and how it talks to each other. So um, on that note, do you want to tell us a little bit about the timeline and when we can hopefully, what, what we can expect for this and hopefully when we can use it? Right, okay. So um, uh, we are currently uh, preparing the document for a uh, third public review. Uh, so that's adding the BJ to uh, BACnet 2016. This will be out soon. Uh, uh, we'll see how fast Ashley can work on this and uh, publish it for the review. <clears throat> then it goes into comments resolution, of course. Uh, we expect that to happen in July. Maybe that becomes August now. But we hope that we can come through without another review cycle. Uh, but if needed, then we would uh, just do an independent substantive changes review cycle, which can be short. And we really plan for a uh, final publication uh, by end of 2019. So uh, uh, products could be available right after publication. So uh, 2020 to 21, uh, we expect products being out in the market. Maybe David, uh, you might add something. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that's all all good. I mean, I, the I guess the only thing that I would add is that uh, one of the things that's unique about BACnet SC, or I guess I should say unprecedented, is the fact that for the first time in BACnet's nearly 30-year uh, history, we have a situation where. Um, literally all of the vendors participating in, in BACnet um, not only realize the significance of SC and the, and the need, uh, but they have all from the beginning said, we, we know this has to happen and we are on board with implementing this ASAP as soon as it, 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 it's published. And that's never happened before. So if you went around and privately polled uh, each of the vendors, they're all deeply committed to uh, implementing SC in their products as soon as they can. That's, that's never happened before in uh, BACnet, and I think that that's a, a, an excellent sign uh, of the uh, industry level of commitment uh, to, to this initiative. Right, right. So um, uh, the only, the harder point, I believe, is that uh, even though Vents might come out with products, we need to uh, get uh, the concepts of security into our industry, right? So because uh, usually when we need VPNs, we call for IT specialists, but uh, I believe that uh, the building automation industry needs to also consider 
how to deal with security because uh, sometimes there is no IT uh, available, sometimes you want to delegate it to IT departments, but overall it's about keeping the keys safe for uh, 30 years, right, for the lifetime of your system. And that's a difficult thing to do because uh, many people are involved uh, over the lifetime and uh, but ultimately, uh, that's the cost of security. Uh, you get keys and you need to take care about your keys, right? But um, yeah, that's, uh, that's about uh, a requirement for the industry that uh, we get aware of uh, these concepts and uh, learn to deal with it. And I believe that this is maybe even the bigger part uh, of the whole security game. Uh, it's not on, we get technical solutions now with Secure Connect and the products. But ultimately, uh, uh, the bigger part is to uh, transform the, uh, the industry to uh, be aware of secure security and learn to deal with uh, security and learn to manage it. Yeah, and as you mentioned, typical IT security is not as long term. I mean, it needs to exist always, but um, our, our, our building systems last a lot longer than IT systems. So. Yeah. We need to start now and we need to keep that for a long time. Yeah, right. And uh, the difference to the IT world is, yeah, first it's the lifetime. Second is that uh, there's usually nobody behind the device. So uh, you cannot call someone uh, to type in something onto the device. The device just sits there and needs to respond on its own. So uh, IT has a simple life in that sense. But we need to be uh, careful that we have solutions that can be deployed and uh, nobody needs to get uh, and reach the device uh, physically in order to, to do some uh, configurations, etc. So uh, ultimately, uh, we have a, a higher demand uh, requirements, I believe, than uh, IT uh, really has because IT usually has some users behind or uh, some stuff even to maintain and uh, uh, keep the servers up. So, uh, but uh, a building automation system is a, uh, is a network of computers and they need to work together uh, over the time uh, of, or, and the lifetime of uh, the building automation system. Great. Um, I think we're gonna spend a little few minutes answering some of these um, slightly more technical questions. Um, I mm -hmm. do have a few questions myself, but one that we're seeing, um, quite a, being asked fairly frequently here is how does it scale up? So um, we're getting, how does it work on systems of 500, 2000 um, devices? Or has, and has that been tested? Do you, how do you envision that? Okay, this really, uh, uh, typically this really depends on uh, the, uh, uh, the capabilities of the hub you are using. Um, and uh, the capabilities of the hub depend on the platform they are sitting and uh, essentially also uh, depending on uh, what other uh, software is running on that platform. But uh, we believe that uh, this can easily scale up to um, a couple hundred uh, connections for a single hub. And then you still have the option, if, if it becomes larger, then um, uh, you, you build multiple Secure Connect networks. So you have multiple hubs and you connect them through uh, Secure Connect to Secure Connect routers. Great. So that's essentially, and we believe that this is this is kind of uh, how we can scale it up. And in particular, the certificate management was designed to uh, to better scale up and support uh, larger installations. So uh, uh, it really depends on uh, the hubs capabilities, and we will come up with some picks uh, additions that uh, uh, explain uh, what your implementation can do for it, for this. Perfect. I, I think in practice, uh, if you have such a large uh, system that there are, are, we should have this problem uh, where there are many, 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 many um, SC devices, you can use larger and more capable hubs. Uh, there, you know, whether the hub physically exists in the cloud or whether it's a larger um, uh, server that's on premises or a combination of both. Uh, the nice thing about this approach uh, is that it scales uh, well to that idea. 
Um, it's unlikely that, uh, for example, a single building automation controller, even a large one, is going to be the same kind of performance as, uh, you know, a regular uh, IT class server. So in, in, in those larger installations, you're going to have bigger and more capable hardware. Right. Um, yeah. So a lot, and again, there's a lot of questions about hubs here. So uh, a very quick one: Can it be a virtual machine? Does it have to be a physical device, or can it be a virtual machine in a data center? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Totally possible. Sure. Yeah, totally possible. Cloud deployment, uh, Docker uh, containers, whatever you want, right? So pick your favorite software environment, implement it, and yeah, Move pick on. the WebSocket library, implement it on top, and uh, that's what you're doing, right? To get, or, or much better, just buy an implementation or get an implementation somewhere, right? Yeah. But it's, it should be easy uh, to do as soon as you have some backend stack code. Uh, it should be easy to repl uh, to add a new data link option to your software. But of course, you need to deal with WebSocket, so that's that's the more um, interesting part. So, picking uh, a useful library is essential here in implementing this. Um, does the hub just reroute the message, or does it actually decode it? Um, it no, uh, de decode it uh, in the sense that yes, it's the ter the hub is the termination of the WebSocket, so the TLS connection is terminated at the hub, so it exists in plane, essentially within the hub, but then goes out again, encrypted and uh, TLS protected through the next connection. Right. So uh, we, we, we do not uh, combine and allow the, we, we do not support uh, making the TLS connections go through the hub. Um, the, the, the hub needs to look at the message, needs to see addresses so that it can properly forward it. So therefore, yes, uh, that's that's uh, 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 that's what happens. But honestly, you would not uh, uh, give uh, the key uh, or let's say the signed certificate to to an untrustful hub that would do all sorts of malicious things, right? So that's really a matter of uh, whom are giving you the key, right? And so that's that holds the same for the hub. And by the way, there are, there are tons of uh, uh, IT environments that, that have uh, middle boxes that do that, that do the same all the time. And um, essentially, even your virus scanner on your local PC uh, does the very same. I don't think any of us can actually answer this question, but I'm going to put it out there. Uh, will existing BACnet devices need to have the firmware updated to support BACnet SD? And I think that's really going to be up to the vendors um, who are making these devices. But um, um, I, I can speak to that, Monica. The, sure. the operative word there is need. Um, the, as a general statement, no BACnet devices require any change uh, in order to continue to participate in a BACnet SC network. Uh, the, there may be a need for an SC to IP or an SC to MSTP router, uh, but those existing IP or uh, MSTP devices uh, themselves won't even know that there's an SC that's out there. Um, yeah, right, right. But, but there is the option, of course, to make a device that is just an SC device, right. or maybe you could uh, you know, configure it so it could be SC or not SC, uh, according to need. Uh, so, no, you don't have to change anything, but you may, a, a vendor or a developer of backend products may decide that they want to make changes uh, so that it is uh, easier to use in an SC environment, or it could be uh, used as an SC or a not SC kind of device. Yes. And I would uh, also say that um, if the device already has a backend IP, then yes, it's just a firmware update uh, so that uh, it, could, it could also support uh, a Secure Connect because it already has the uh, network infrastructure to connect to the IP network so it can run a Secure Connect or it can run backend IP. That's really just a, a software issue. And uh, so a firmware update uh, uh, can can be done to support Secure Connect, but it's not needed, as David says. 
And at the other hand, um, it also depends a bit. We have seen that uh, even pretty small platforms still work uh, and can support uh, uh, a web socket going out from the node, from the device. So uh, yes, generally uh, it's a firmware update uh, whenever vendors uh, try to support Secure Connect with their existing products, then uh, it's a firmware update. So there's no need to change the box. Perfect. Um, okay. We'll come back to more questions if we have time, but I do want to go over um, with you guys what's next. So once this all comes out and is launched, uh, what what's the committee going to be working on next? What are the next steps for back in FC or back in general? Okay, uh, so we have a couple of points that we want to continue on. First is that we need to uh, shape the network port object to support uh, secure connect configuration through the network port object. That's not done yet. Uh, so secure connect can be implemented in all protocol revisions. And whenever you need a network port object, you just have one and you declare the proprietary network type for now. But we essentially want to uh, extend the network port object that uh, Secure Connect can be configured, including security certificates, etc., through the network port object. But uh, uh, that's then still um, implement options whether they provide also other ways uh, for configuring security, for example. So um, that's one of the important topics. Uh, where we uh, work on in the IT working group. Uh, another one is essentially to uh, uh, standardize how to use MQTT brokers out from uh, Secure Connect devices. That's another thing that we want to extend uh, after publication of this version now. And last but not least, uh, uh, to support uh, more uh, auto configuration features. For example, we consider uh, and we discuss a service discovery mechanism to find the hub so that nodes can automatically find the hub. They don't need to be configured. And also um, to get some automatic uh, security bootstrapping. Uh, and there we essentially wait for the IETF to come up with some solutions. Uh, uh, on how this can work. So this would then uh, even reduce the uh, manual work for setting up security could, could be uh, automated as well. So this goes towards uh, auto configuration of Secure Connect, but that uh, those pieces will come uh, later, I guess. We need to see uh, whether we find contributors doing that or not. Perfect. And uh, for those of you who don't know much about BACnet and how it, uh, how these decisions are made, this is a committee of volunteers. And do you guys, do you want to talk a little bit about if people are interested in this and want to get involved, um, how they can have help ha have an impact on all of these wonderful things that you've just talked about? David, would you like to take that? Sure. <laughs> um, the the, from the beginning, uh, the BACnet uh, SPC, or Standard Project Committee, which is now a, an SSPC, a Standing Standard Project Committee, uh, has always been open to anyone to participate. The meetings uh, are free. Uh, anyone can walk in and sit down at the table and uh, have a voice. Um, the, there are also... Um, uh, mailing lists and, and Yahoo groups and so on uh, that uh, that are used to have exchanges between um, uh, committee members and you can join those uh, groups as well. So you know anyone who's interested in the standard making process and uh, having a voice in it is welcome to at the table uh, at, at all times. Um, the uh, people can feel free to, to contact either either of well any of the three of us uh, if they need to uh, to you know find out how to get involved in, in that kind of work and uh, you know uh, I I can say that uh, we can never have enough people involved in that and uh, certainly welcome new participants. Right, right. So another uh, pass to uh, the get to information would be uh, uh, go for backnet.org. 
and then uh, find the IT working group and then uh, you can essentially contact the convener so he uh, he will provide all information uh, for you to join and uh, help us uh, in this work. So we do have I think 30 more questions so we're not going to get to all of them um, but we'll cover a few more um, if you guys are okay with that Bernhard and David. Sure. Sure. All kinds of things here. Um, what happens when a certificate expires? Yeah, yeah. Then uh, essentially, we uh, we require that the uh, certificate expiration gets checked, so the device would would essentially drop out of the network and would not be able to get in. So um, uh, there should be a timely certificate update uh, to the devices, and uh, yeah, that's that's just a requirement. When, when you really want to have uh, certificates to expire, and, uh, but uh, yes, that's that's the price. But uh, given that we come up with, uh, with the MPO configuration soon, uh, then uh, this can be done uh, through uh, Backnet itself in an interoperable way. Just for now, you would need uh, to get uh, the vendor tools either by uh, having them as an owner or uh, having contracted with, with vendors about their tools. So that you get able to uh, 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 adopt uh, and add some new certificates. But later on, it would be possible in an interoperable way through Backnet, but this requires the MPO extensions. So that's why we essentially prioritize the MPO extensions. And again, Bernard, I would just add uh, the, the short version of that is that it is our desire and intent to make. A standardized interoperable way uh, to do cert um, certificate and key management, uh, and that's going to become part of SC uh, going forward. Uh, but we did not, we decided in the end uh, that because that's very complicated, it's hard to get everybody to agree on how to do it, and that we didn't want to hold up the uh, introduction of SC uh, in the absence of that. So, but that is definitely future, important future work. Sure. Yeah, we'll see a lot more updates to SC going forward, I'm sure. Okay. As you talked about. Um, okay, and somebody else wanted to know uh, a great question. Do you know when it will be incorporated into the uh, BTL, so the BACnet testing lab? Well, that's really a very good question. And uh, uh, so we, we, we are discussing how this can be solved. But uh, um, there is there are groups working on uh, uh, adding tests for uh, testing the data link for now. But otherwise, I believe that uh, you can um, implement it, go uh, for BTL testing, and they will just test your uh, application level uh, functionality and not necessarily particular SC features for now. But uh, the only uh, thing what might happen is that as soon as they would have a full-blown test suite, they might call you back for that testing, but maybe uh, until then you have a new version that you anyway go for testing. So um, that's to me, that's not necessarily a big hurdle. And uh, given that you can implement the SC in all the protocol revisions, so you know, don't need to update your device to the very latest protocol revision in order to support SC. You can you can go with your pro protocol revision plans as you are, and uh, and you can get. Uh, to uh, uh, BTL testing with that. Uh, what I expect is that BTL will uh, will build up some infrastructure so that they really can test uh, secure connect devices, but they will not test uh, the data link specific part of your device. They, they will test the device as, as usual, uh, but not necessarily particular data link functionality for now. So um, the BTL is not not a hurdle. You can go certify certi certify your backend product, but uh, there might not be a particular interoperability testing of secure connect data link uh, functionality. But nevertheless, they will have uh, let's say a communication peer for that, and um, uh, at least uh, that communication should take place. It should be possible to take place. That's probably that test that they would have for now. Sounds good. We're going to do our last question, um, which is, 
uh, it's actually two questions that I'm combining into one. So people wanted to know what will happen to services like Visual Backnet, which I can speak a little bit to. Um, but also generally, if Wireshark captures only have encrypted data, how will communication be deciphered? And then someone else wanted to ask, how, how will troubleshooting work between devices? Um, say, for example, a COB threshold is set really low and there's a large amount of, of traffic, how will we, we figure that out? Yeah, okay. So that's kind of a, uh, an interesting question because uh, on one hand, we want to make it secure. On the other hand, we still want to look into Right, that's a, a contradiction in itself somehow. But yes. nevertheless, there is some help for that. Uh, either you uh, use some kind of a middle box function that uh, allows to uh, uh, see the communication in plane, or uh, you get the keys installed in your Wireshark so that Wireshark becomes able to decrypt. However, uh, that might not work anymore with uh, TLS version 1.3 because um, uh, TLS version 1.3 requires uh, that uh, uh, is supporting forward uh, secrecy only, which requires that uh, you are part of the key exchange to be able to uh, uh, decrypt. And so the Wireshark would need to sit in between and um, uh, take care of, of the key exchange so that it can participate in the communication because just recorded stuff is uh, no longer possible to decrypt. That's uh, the, the uh, TLS version 1.3 and uh, yeah, that's uh, how it works. But it can be done, it's a bit more expensive and uh, but nevertheless it can be done uh, to uh, break off this uh, contradiction right? and still looking to even though it's secure. Yeah, and I but, think that yeah. Again, it's a, it's a question of the keys, you know. And I think that will be said for any services like Visual Backnet or any analytics or any anything you're adding to your network is always going to be a question of giving them access, securely giving them access to the data, whether that's through encryption keys or some other means, um, but primarily it'll be managing those keys. Yeah, right, right. So the uh, whenever those uh, uh, implementations, those applications support Secure Connect, they, they need the key to join, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, uh, on the application level, there is absolutely no change to those applications, right? Because we, we are just adding a, a data link option. So the applications at itself, they stay as they are. There is no change needed. And uh, this also holds for um, uh, vendors that want to uh, uh, keep up and uh, uh, support Secure Connect. There is no change on the application level. Great. A huge thank you to Bernhard and David for this, um, all of this information and the high level and the di di diving in deep and giving us specifics. Thanks so much, you guys. Thank you for the chance to be here and speak. Yeah, yes. no problem. Again, thanks so much for your time today. Let us know if you have any other questions. Have a good day. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.